Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Science at the Theater's Eight Big Ideas, sponsored by the Friends of Berkeley Lab. My name is Jeff Miller. I realize I didn't introduce myself uh, two, two sessions ago. And I'm head of public affairs at the lab, and I will be your host for this evening. Now, I usually ask this question last, but tonight I'm going to ask it first. For those who are here for the first time, could you please raise your hands? Oh, this is great. Wow, OK, well, the second question seems a little ridiculous then because I was going to ask how many of you were here for our spring Big Ideas show. OK, you liked it in your back. That's great. Well, uh, I don't know that you know, or maybe I've mentioned it before, but we post these videos to University of California Television, and they promote them and rebroadcast. And uh, I looked uh, yesterday to see how well the one from the spring had done. And to my amazement and happiness, uh, 530,000 people have watched uh, that one in the spring. So I'm very happy about that. Which is a reminder to all of you that during the Q&A session, remember about the questions you ask, because there are going to be hundreds of thousands of people who are going to see you. <laughs> OK, so the question becomes, can scientists really talk about their science in eight minutes? And we say that they can. And of course, we have a new timer now. Last time, I think we counted up. This time, we can count down. And the great thing is that I actually can control this with this remote. Furthermore, it has a beeper when you get to zero. <laughs> Beeps three times. So it may be kind of rude, but I think it, we've, uh, we've tested you know, and we've worked with the scientists, and I think we're going to make it OK. But you have a role to play as well, and that is at about the, let's say, the 15 second mark here, at 15 seconds, I'd like you to applaud very softly as a reminder. So we're going to practice now, just a very soft, soft applause. Maybe a little louder. I'm up here talking, and I, OK. Because the punchlines often come at the end, so we just want to remind them that they're coming. With that, I would like to introduce our first Berkeley Lab scientist, Christine Pearson, who's going to talk about a Google for materials. Please welcome her warmly. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking about a Google for materials. And why would we want that? Um, I happen to think that materials enable society, and they change the way we do things. There is a reason we call our ages after materials, the Iron Age, the Bronze Age. Uh, our own communication age is only possible because we found materials that can transmit signals for huge long distances without being perturbed, without changing the way they look. And I've added some other examples here. We today build bridges and airplanes out of carbon fiber composite, um, which is, makes them lighter, cheaper, and they last longer. Uh, one of my favorite examples are nylons. Um, we came up with them because we wanted to make lighter and more durable parachutes, but of course DuPont realized they were sitting on a gold mine. Um, so how do we come up with new materials? How do we come up with things that make these amazing changes to society and that we can enable new technologies and even societal changes? Well, there's the Edison style. Edison in the late 19th century um, tried to come up with a filament for the light bulb that he had invented. And he painstakingly tried 3,000 materials over years to come up with the best one. Um, he didn't. The one that we use today in the old kind of style light bulbs, tungsten, wasn't among those 3,000 materials. So he suggested carbon, carbon coming from bamboo. And because, because that wasn't in the test set, he just couldn't come up with it. So that's the Edisonian approach, the tra traditional approach of basically trying everything you can lay your hands on. Hollywood style. <laughs> How does Tony Stark come up with a new material? I would love to do this. Um, he basically has Jarvis render the periodic table, and he's so smart, he just picks out the best elements. And he, um, he then he sort of synthesizes it in his hands or in the computer, throws it off to check for biological compatibility. Isn't that amazing? In about 10 seconds. I hate to tell you guys, but we're closer to Edison. 
than we are to Tony Stark. Um, reality check is that it takes about 18 years from the time a material is discovered in the lab, a new material, to being commercially su successful. And that's because there's always something wrong with materials. Always, there's always a weak link that we have to engineer around or fix. But we don't have this kind of time. For the things we care about, you know, better photovoltaics, better solar panels, better batteries, we can't wait 18 years and we don't even have the new materials. So how can we make this better? Well, this is where I come in. I'm a theorist. I, do, I make materials in the computer. So I'm, I'm hedging towards Tony Stark, but I'm not quite there yet. And I exist because clever people like Schrodinger um, and computers can enable us to actually predict how materials work, never making them, just simulating it in the computer. And this is actually a quantum mechanical simulation for a real material where ions move. And this is a super fast ionic conductor. This, could, this is a material that could enable our lithium ion batteries to become a lot safer because it would have a solid state electrolyte and not one that burns. That's one computer. If I had NERSC, if I had a whole supercomputing center at my disposal, I could predict materials, I could predict properties for thousands of materials per week. Imagine now suddenly Edison throwing his 3,000 at me, I could crunch through that in a week. He took years to do it. So this is how two amazing things, the, the ability to solve the laws of physics and our computers enable us to actually screen materials in silico. And I wouldn't be standing here if it hadn't actually worked or if I didn't believe in it to the point where I've seen it work. In 2004, 2005, I was at MIT and I was working as part of a team um, to come up with a new uh, cathode for these little rechargeable alkaline batteries, which I bet is in this little dude, for example, or non-rechargeables. Um, we screened over 100,000 materials in the computer. 1,500 of them had better energy than what is currently used, but only 200 had even a chance of making it in the very corrosive electrolyte. That became the weak link. That was the hard property to screen on. That was just the beginning. Since then, we've screened and found novel classes of lithium ion battery electrodes. Uh, we've come up with um, improved transparent conductors, which is one of the materials that go into our um, solar panels to make them cheaper and better. But where do we want to go? And this is where I turn to the children in, in, the, in the audience. Um, when I, I have two daughters, one in middle school and one in elementary school. And if I ask them, give me a good battery material, come up with a material for me that is good for batteries, what would they do? Well, they'd Google it, right? <laughs> that's, that's, you know, that's the truth for you. You ask children. Um, and that's if you ask an elementary school kid or, or somebody in middle school, but if they know a little bit more, they've gone to college or something and they know something about batteries, then they might go something like this. Well, I need a material that has a specific voltage window and it needs to be stable and needs to have good lithium ion mobility. Google will not give a right answer to this. <laughs> so we need to do better than that. Um, and me and um, my, my colleague at MIT, We've launched something that is the beginning of a Google for materials. We've put all of those calculations that we've used to screen for novel battery materials online, free to use for anyone who wants to use them. Um, and there's more than 30,000 materials computed for different applications. You can use it for photovoltaics. You can use it for batteries. And we hope that people will use them, um, that people who come up with better materials for tomorrow will use resources like this where you can actually, in a search interface, put in those materials properties and there will come a list of materials that actually fit those criteria. But this is just the beginning and I'm hoping that other people will do this too. We're a lot better at sharing our experiences from restaurants on Yelp than we are about giving our um, research results freely on the web. So this is my challenge to every scientist in the world that we should all be doing this. We should all be putting our research online for other people to use. So. I suppose I'm coming very close to my, uh, my, my eight minutes. Um, and I'll just leave you with this. A materials, a materials Google and hopefully uh, amazing materials for the future to solve our energy problems and others. Thank you. Thank you. Wow.
So Christine, Christine, are you going to cede your 45 seconds to one of our other presenters? Maybe, OK. All right, next up is Ben Bowen, uh, who's going to talk to you about his great idea, which is um, mass spectrometry imaging. Correct. Thank you. So I'm glad you all could come here tonight. Mass spectrometry imaging is something some of you might be familiar with, but if not, I'll give you a brief primer, and then I'll tell you what's probably keeping it from getting involved in medicine today. So mass spectrometry imaging is a new chemical imaging technique that allows us to measure more information about biological samples than ever before possible. Right now, you're finding it used in cutting edge research laboratories, but if all goes according to plan, it'll eventually find its way into hospitals and in medical care. It might be used for things like diagnosis of cancer, making safer drugs, personalization of medicine, but just generally give options for healthcare treatment not currently available. So here's an example of what a mass spectrometry image looks like. Shown in these three colors, red, green, and blue, are three different molecules. Where the image is red, that's where the first molecule is more abundant. Where the image is green, the second molecule is more abundant. And where it's orange, it would be a mixture of the two molecules. So you know, when we look at different molecules simultaneously, we can learn a lot more information about the sample than just by looking at them one at a time. But if mass spectrometry imaging only allowed us to see these three molecules, they wouldn't have invited me to speak to you today, probably. That's not very interesting. So in this image, there's hundreds of other molecules present. We're just not displaying them in this simple three-color image. So mass spectrometry imaging allows us to simultaneously measure hundreds of molecules. That brings a lot of new challenges. How do you make visualizations of hundreds of molecules? These files are huge, the size of computer hard drives. So how do you store this data, share this data? How do you analyze this data with algorithms? And then lastly, the, the role of many of these molecules we detect in these images, their role is unknown. We don't know what these molecules do. So how do we store this observation and propagate that into future experiments? So how do we take mass spectrometry images? A laser is rapidly scanned across a sample. The laser is highly focused, very bright, and it blasts a little bit of tissue into the gas phase. So this desorption event at every position where a tiny bit of the tissue is blown up into the gas phase can put the molecules in such a way that we can analyze them with a mass analyzer. We have to do this very carefully or the molecules will be blown to smithereens, so we have to not break any bonds. So once they're analyzed, you'll have a very sharp peak with an uncertainty of about the mass of a single electron. So these peaks are known at a very precise mass, very accurate mass. So if two molecules have a similar mass, we can make two separate images for them. Here's what it looks like after the laser has shot the tissue. There's tiny little holes in it. Where each hole is, that would be another position that had been shot with the laser and a new spectrum recorded. So you've probably figured out by now we're not recording images with our laser, but we're recording chemical spectra at every position. So in these spectra, here's an example from one position from a brain. The tallest peaks are lipids that make up the cell membrane in the brain. But in this spectrum, at this single position, you might find proteins, you might find small molecules like nucleic acids, amino acids, sugars. You might find drug molecules. You might find caffeine or nicotine, these types of things in the spectrum. So this is a chemical imaging technique where at every position we're recording real molecules, lots of them. This is one spectrum at one position. So we can take a molecule like this one at this position and find it in all the other positions, and that'll make an image like this. So here's an image of one lipid in the brain. Here's the same brain, different lipid. So it might be a surprise that the very similar cells, these are all neurons in the brain, have a completely different molecular profile, different molecules present. But when you think about the diverse roles that the cells have to perform in our body, it shouldn't be a surprise that they use different molecules to perform those tasks. So like I said these data files are big. One spectrum can have a you know, a million elements in this single spectrum. And if you have 100,000 locations in an image or a million locations in an image, you, you have just an astronomical amount of data, more data points than people on Earth in a file. So you can't just look through this data point by point. You have to use advanced computer algorithms. 
So shown here is a multivariate statistical decomposition of a tumor into regions that are metabolically unique. These different regions have you know, different expression patterns of molecules, and we could run this data through an uh, advanced algorithm, and the algorithm automatically tells us that they're metabolically distinct. We don't know how to interpret this data right now, but you could imagine in the future, a doctor would take biopsies from a tumor, and it would tell the doctor that, hey, you know, there's different cell types here. I don't want to treat this with one drug, but a combination of drugs tuned to the personal, personalized observation. So we had this finding completely validated by blind histology. This process wasn't easy, so we want to make this faster. This was a big data problem. This took a tremendous amount of effort to do this for one tumor. Days of computation. So we can also do this in three dimensions. Here's a three-dimensional image of a tumor. So now we just exploded the big data to even bigger. So this file, if you thought of it as a stack of books, it would be one and a half miles tall for this one file as kind of an analogy to how much data you're really dealing with here. So we need algorithms. So these bottlenecks are keeping emerging technologies like mass spectrometry imaging, but there's many other technologies that are like this. These bottlenecks are keeping these tools from prime time. You can't generate data that's not analyzable. That, uh, your doctor, I mean, billing $300 an hour, they're gonna, you know, that's gonna take them a while to analyze this data. It takes a month to do one tumor. <laughs> So we need to make this faster. We need to make new methods for transparency of how the data is collected so that we know. But we also need standard methods, standardization of these protocols so that it can work at scale. So in my last slide, I'm gonna tell you about the solution that we've developed here at Berkeley Lab, what we think is a solution to this problem. It's the OpenMSI project. OpenMSI aims to bring the most advanced computing, like what you heard in the previous talk, right through the web browser, so that when someone generates one of these files, they upload the data to NERSC, the supercomputing facility in Oakland, one of the largest supercomputers in the world. The data gets analyzed at NERSC, stored at NERSC, so now you don't have to have you know, these giant external hard drives filling your backpack everywhere you go. It's all sitting, sitting there in a supercomputing data center. The algorithms run on these uh, super fast, big computers to produce nice results that we can all look at in the browser. This allows the data to be shared, analyzed by teams, interpreted by experts, but then it's also stored for future scientists so that when you come in to look at the data, you can do that on the shoulders of people that have analyzed this type of data before you. That's all I got. I'm right on time. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think they're all afraid of your applause. They're finishing early. Uh, so next up is Peter Urshus, who has a very fun job at the lab imaging atoms in 3D. Please welcome Peter. Thank you. Hi. So today, uh, I'm going to talk to you about imaging atoms in 3D. And a lot of you in school might have been told uh, that the building blocks of materials are atoms. But have you ever actually seen an atom? What I'm going to show you today are some images in two dimensions of, uh, of atoms that we take on our microscope, one of the uh, most powerful electron microscopes up at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And I'm going to tell you how that's not even enough uh, that we have to go to actually image them, imaging them in three dimensions. So let's take a step back and think about the scale of things a little bit. So if you look up into the cosmos, you can really think of how many uh, stars and planets and galaxies are out there. But if you pick up something like a piece of grass or a rock or something from the floor and you look at it really closely, if you look at it really closely, like with an electron microscope or at very high magnification, you can see something equally as wondrous. These materials are made of much smaller building blocks and components. And as we keep going down and down and down to higher in magnification, we get down to the atom. And the atoms are the basic building blocks of materials. And so um, on the right here, we see uh, uh, an image that was formed with a beam of electrons. And this is an image of gold nanoparticles, which looks kind of similar to this image of stars and galaxies and things uh, from out in outer space. Um, so these are actually really important. They're really important building blocks of materials. And the problem is light microscopes are not able to see these kinds of things. Light microscopes use photons to, to magnify objects. 
and photons are actually pretty big compared to what I look at. So um, electrons are much smaller than photons, and so we can use them to take small pictures of things that are much, much smaller. So although these are very small objects, they're about five nanometers in size, they contain about 10,000 atoms apiece. And so at this, even at this magnification, we wouldn't be able to tell what the really building blocks of these materials really is. So um, the manipulation of uh, atoms uh, on the ba very basic scale to create materials that have real world effects is, is called nanotechnology. You might have heard of it. Um, Richard Feynman, a very famous physicist, back in 1959, uh, had a very famous lecture called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, and he kind of kicked off this whole nanotechnology thing. And one of the most famous quotes in that is, he, it, it goes as follows, it would be very easy to make an analysis of any complicated chemical substance. All one would have to do would be to look at it and see where all the atoms are. So this is a great idea. All you have to do is take a picture of something, look at where the atoms are, and you can figure out what its real world effect is going to be. That's a really great idea. So the problem was, there was one problem in 1959, and he immediately uh, told us all about that problem. So the only trouble is that the electron microscope is 100 times too poor. I put this out as a challenge. Is there no way to make the electron microscope more powerful? So Richard Feynman gives us this great idea. Just take a picture of it, look at it, and then he gives us a challenge. Look, you got to make these electron microscopes much more powerful in order to do that. So there have been recent advances in uh, focusing electron beams down such that we can now take pictures of, of atoms, of materials. Um, but even, that, e even at this scale, he's not going to be uh, as uh, happy as we might have thought. So here, I'm showing a picture from our very advanced electron microscope. And you can see that um, there, are, there are columns of atoms here. There are these white dots. These are about five nanometers across. And um, the thing is, you see different patterns in all of these different nanoparticles. Each one of these structures is made of gold. And they all have pretty much the same arrangement of atoms. The thing is, they're all arranged in different ways, so the viewing angle actually matters a lot. So we can't tell that all of these objects are kind of very, very similar. So in certain points, you can see dots like this here and up in here. So you can see those are columns of 1 to 10 atoms that are projected in two dimensions. These three-dimensional crystals, objects, are being projected onto a two-dimensional detector, basically. Um, so this, Mr. Feynman would not be happy enough with. We can see that, we can see atoms, we can see the atomic structure of the materials, but we can't really figure out what the actual full three-dimensional size of the object is. What's really exciting here is you can see these little dots that are here on the, on the substrate of the material, where, and especially where this red arrow is going, that's one single atom of gold. So there, you've seen an atom. So the problem is basically given by this little cartoon here. Here we have this funny bunny, right? And he's standing in front of a projector. And what you might think, if you were only to be able to look at the detector, look at the screen, you might think that what's in between the source and the detector is actually a hand. But it's actually this bunny. So if you were able to maybe look at this from a few different orientations, you might be able to figure out, wait, something's funny is going on here. So I want everyone right now to try and experiment with me. And so I want everyone to close one eye. And then hold your fingers up in front of your face, kind of close like this. And now try to touch your two fingers together. It's kind of hard, right? All right, now open both eyes and now try to do it again. It's much easier. And if it's not, then you should go see a doctor. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what we've got here is your brain, you have two eyes, so you have two views. So you get kind of a three-dimensional image of everything that you're looking at right now. So that's nice. But in the microscope, we have things that are much more complicated than simply trying to put two fingers together. We have atomic arrangements of 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 atoms. So what we need to do is we actually need to take about 70 images of our object, or more than that, at many different orientations. And this is probably one of the most uh, highest resolution three-dimensional images you can get. And this is actually platinum atoms in a three-dimensional three nanocrystal. That's about five nanometers across, something like that. And you can see, as we spin it around, that the object actually, the, all the columns of atoms will line up briefly, and you'll see that, that atomic structure. But as we keep going around, you can see all kinds of defects and, pro, and uh, uh, different regions in the material where the, the atomic arrangement looks very, very different. And that's because there are defects in the material and different types of crystals that are all put together. And a lot of crystals actually look like this. Um, and those defects are what we really want to be able to image, because it's not just 
that it's a perfect crystal, it's that it's an imperfect crystal, and those imperfections in the crystal are what give it a lot of its, uh, its properties. And so by imaging objects in three dimensions, not only two dimensions, and at atomic resolution, we can really figure out how these objects are put together, and then we can start building better materials using these, uh, using these materials. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Wow. I'm impressed. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, please, for those watching online as well as those here with us in, in live, if you would like to make notes about the individual presenters, please do so. Um, you can say if you like them or don't like them, but just add that level of detail if you could. That would be very helpful. So next, can we generate electricity from viruses? Uh, doesn't seem possible, but sung Uk Lee is going to now come out and explain it to us. Please welcome him. Hi, good evening, everybody. So today, I'm going to introduce a totally new way to generate the electricity that the title says that using the viruses. So when we take a look at the viruses, we don't have uh, much good images, which is uh, viruses usually make you sick or ill. Some of the computer viruses hack your computers and then destroy all your important data. <laughs> so that is a kind of the problematic viruses. But there is a many different type of the viruses. We can still use it for a really good purpose such as delivering the drugs or cure the disease. So in our laboratory, we use a non harmful very useful viruses, and then trying to design a new type of the materials. But they have a very amazing uh, characteristic that no other material have, which is uh, viruses are usually very easy to amplify. So therefore, if we have one viruses and mix them together with a host cell, we can easily end up with a trillions or zillions of uh, viruses at the same time, they produce exactly identical, identical copies that we first design. And depending on how we make it, these uh, copies, we can also induce the mutation you know, very quickly. So therefore, we can evolve these materials very quickly and then design a new properties. And most of them have uh, exactly the uh, same shape. So therefore, we can easily put them together in a self-assembled manner to design a new type of the devices. So therefore, using this type of the characteristics of the viruses, we design a new electric energy generating viruses. The working principle is called the piezoelectricity. So piezoelectricity is defined by the convergence between the mechanical forces and electric energies. So piezin is basically means that press in Greek. So therefore, some of the material, especially piezo piezoelectric material, have a charge which is balanced very well in some specific order of structures. And then when we put uh, a pressure in this type of the materials, we can basically break their balance of the charge and then induce some of the partial positive and negative charge here. So therefore, in this case, we can induce the potential through the pressures. There is a many different type of the piezoelectric materials already utilized in our daily life, such as our wrist, um, the watch. They have uh, piezoelectric materials, so therefore, if we put the battery, they just uh, ticks uh, one every one second and then move your needle uh, to measure your time. And there is also other many different type of the piezoelectric materials, especially in this uh, Netherlands. They use it very amazing purpose. Basically, we can dance around and can operate all this brightening in this sustainable dance floor. So therefore, we convert <laughs> your bodily movement as electrical energies. So therefore, these materials are very useful. But there is some of the problem, which is uh, these materials are very expensive to produce. At the same time, they are composed of the many harmful chemicals there. So therefore, it will be very useful that non-toxic and then very cheap to make this type of the material be useful. So fortunately, most of the biological materials are piezoelectric, such as the DNA or protein. But more fortunately, so the viruses that we are using called the amsotin bacterial phase have also piezoelectric property because there's a DNA inside and then they have uh, some protein that have a uh, charge that coiled all these surfaces. Especially the DNA is a negatively charged. So therefore this protein is somehow evolved to produce plus charge inside and negative charge outside and then coiled 3,000 times of these materials. So therefore, when we use this type of the materials that have plus and, mi uh, plus and minus charge, and then mechanically deform, basically we break all these balance, charge balance, and then now we induce 
uh, some of the potential energy from these viruses. So that is our hypothesis. So therefore, in order to prove this concept, we use a very special uh, microscope that called the piezo responsive first microscope that have the long sticks, and then we touch this nanoscale uh, sub substance in a very specific manner. During the time, we apply the electric field, so therefore, we can induce some of the mechanical force in these viruses. Depending on mode, we can measure their kind of the pushing up or downward, or so we can also measure some of the force jet generated from out of plane of these materials. So using these speci specific microscopy techniques, we first uh, prove that our viruses have a piezoelectric phenomenon using these type of the images. So therefore, when we scan through the, these virus surfaces, so now we can begin to see the white or dark type of the string pattern, which is uh, these viruses are pushing this needle to upward or downward. Well, in these images in the virus area, they push this needle in the out of the plane way. So therefore, we first prove that the virus they have a piezoelectric properties. But another amazing feature of these materials are they have uh, identical copies and then behave like this kind of the matchstick. So therefore, when we have a really low concentration of these viruses, there's a no order. But when we have enough concentration like this matchstick, now all of these viral particles are self-assembled them together and then generate the order structures. So therefore, when we put this type of the ordered materials in between two electrodes, now when we push these materials, they begin to generate the electric states. So therefore, this is a picture, first picture that operate the microelectronic devices using virus-based electric cities. That here is a virus, surface, uh, virus films, and then we press, and then basically connected with uh, this liquid crystal display, and then we power these devices to show number one. So that is a very exciting Eureka moment, so which is a very hard to believe. So this is a May 2012 that we produce very small amount of this uh, current, which is of five nano amperes and around 300 millivolt scale. And last two years, we working very hard and then engineer these viruses and then improve the physical structure of when we fabricate these devices. So therefore, now we improve the quality, the performance of these devices more than 20 times. So therefore, similar devices when we push. So now we can spell out the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory which is uh, I paid by the LBL. So therefore, now we envision that we can use similar type of the devices, and then somehow in the future, five or 10 years later, we can create the personalized electric generated that mount on our shoes. So therefore, whenever we're walking around, we can produce clean and green energies. Most importantly, most of the conventional piezoelectric uh, materials are very toxic but these materials are environmentally friendly. At the same time, it's biocompatible. So therefore, we envision that same materials can be mounted on our heart or our kind of the pulsation site. So therefore, we can generate all our bodily movement as electric energies. So in order to do so, we still need to understand what is the basic science behind these biological materials. At the same time, we need to improve the power performance of these virus-based electronics. Thank you very much. Should we hear the buzzer just to hear it? You want to hear it just to hear it? Okay, we're almost there. Yeah, the beep. That's it. Six, five, four, three, two, one. There you go. Gonna restart. Okay, so uh, we're halfway through, so how about a round of applause for the first four? They beat the timer, they beat the clock. So next Berkeley Lab scientist is Jeff Urban, who thinks about energy in some new ways. Please welcome Jeff. Good evening. My name is Jeff Urban, I'm a material scientist up at the lab, and tonight I'm gonna tell you about how I employ the concept of synergy when designing materials for energy applications. So first I have to define synergy, right? So synergy is the concept embodied by the equation I showed at the top of one plus one equals three. So that is when you put two materials together, you don't just get the linear sum, you get some new emergent functions. And just for an example from chemistry, here's good old sodium, 
metal you might be familiar with. And it's very reactive. So here's uh, sodium being tossed into a pot of water, and you can see it's very, very reactive. And chlorine, which some of you may know, is this sort of bilious, you know, unpleasant gas. So you might say, if I put those two together, sodium and chlorine, what might I get? Sort of a toxic, roaming, metallic glass? No, one actually gets, right, I've heard several people in the audience say it, good old sodium chloride, salt. So this is a case of a material's synergy where two materials are interacting and you get a new function that emerges from that, okay? So it turns out I definitely didn't invent this and it's been around science for a long time. Nature does it really, really well. These are two materials that might be familiar to you. This is an abalone shell on top and this is the bone in the bottom. And you think of these as really hard, tough materials, right? I mean, we th thank goodness, right, for those of us who fall off our bicycles with regularity. Um, but it turns out they're not just constructed out of hard materials, which might be a little surprising. They're constructed out of hard materials and soft materials when you take a look at them. And it turns out you don't need just bricks to make a tough, resilient material. You need bricks and mortar, so hard materials and soft materials. And this is an example, another example from biology of a material synergy, okay? So I applied this concept to materials for energy applications. And as you might see, hard materials and soft materials, like rocks or inorganic materials as I call them, and soft materials like plastics or polymers, are naturally maybe a little distrustful of one another. They don't, they don't naturally play together well, okay? So one of the great things about working in the lab and with the diverse set of sort of collaborators I get to work with is that I get to learn from everybody about the individual properties of materials and how to get them to play together nicely so that they're not so mistrustful from one another and that we can build new materials with emergent functions like biology does, or like the example I showed you at the top. So now I'm gonna tell you about two examples where I've united those worlds of the hard materials, the inorganic materials, and the soft materials, the organic materials, to provide new function for materials and energy applications, okay? So the first one I'm gonna tell you about is about energy storage. And hydrogen is a fuel that I've studied for a while and I like because when you combust it, it has no carbon. So when you run it and you run an engine off of it, the combustion product, if you will, is water. That's very benign and makes me sort of eager to study it. One of the challenges of working with it as a fuel is embodied right here. If you try to use it, and you get enough of it that you can drive your car 300 miles, you need an enormous volume of it, and it's prohibitive to really have a reasonable vehicle. So you might say, well, let's squish it, right, down into a liquid. You can see even the word liquid doesn't fit on there. So <laughs> it's a really, it's a hard job to do and do correctly, right? So it, it turns out material's been very nice to us, and nature's been very nice to us, and it metals of a sort, and I'm excited about magnesium, but I showed you a metal up at the top, um, sodium, that's very, very reactive. Metals chew up hydrogen, they love to store it. They store it very, very densely. They store it more densely than a liquid or a gas, which might seem surprising. Right, hmm. <laughs> I have a question, there's a Q&A question coming, right? So, um, but it turns out they are very reactive, not quite as reactive as sodium, um, but they are quite reactive. So I'm gonna explain the approach I took with soft materials and hard materials using this sort of cartoon. So Maggie is magnesium. That's the metal that I work with. And as you can see, Maggie is a very rapacious little creature. So I want Maggie just to eat hydrogen and form this nice stable metal hydride. But it turns out Maggie likes to eat fish and surfers and other things. So we put Maggie in a cage. Now in this case, it's a polymeric cage. So now we have a rather stable, well-behaved version of Maggie, magnesium, that can chew up hydrogen without getting into too much trouble. Okay, that's good. But we also want to be able to fuel our vehicles very quickly. So we need another trick in order to do this. So instead of having that volume contain one Maggie, I work with nanoscale materials, whereby, not to scale, you know, we can fit many, many Maggies in the same volume. Therefore, we can chew up and store all that hydrogen very, very quickly relative to one big chunk of magnesium. So we've made this material, which is actually the magnesium or the Maggie in the polymeric cage, and you can see it, we're handling it here, uh, trust me on this one, in open air, um, right in one of our chemical safety hoods. And it's completely stable. It's totally, totally harmless and stable. And we've left it there for six months and done studies on it, and it's relatively unaltered. And the proof is in the pudding at the end of the day. Now this is a chart of how much hydrogen this material you know, soaks up versus time. 
And magnesium all by itself with no help and a very large relative to you know, nanoscale. These are microns. It's a thousand times more large in scale. It's very, very slow. It doesn't even take it up noticeably on the order of an hour. But the nanoscale hydrogen, Maggie, eater, in the composite is actually very, very fast. Okay? So another area and another realm of energy science that I'm excited about, um, and I've realized these material synergies, is in thermoelectrics. Now, it might be a, a new word, um, not quite as popular as photovoltaics and other things you've heard of. But they tell you what they do right in the title. These are materials and devices that change thermal energy, thermo, into electrical energy. That's a pretty powerful concept, right? You can put this device near a fire and out you get electricity. So this is a very important thing because engines, like car engines, or really any engine you can think of, whether it's a glass blowing plant or industry, are not perfectly efficient. Thermodynamics tells us that. And how inefficient are they? Well, just your standard car engine, if you think about putting in 100 units of fuel, only about 30% of that goes to running the car, kinetic energy. The rest of that is actually lost as waste heat. And you know that because your engine gets very, very warm even if you just drive down the street to Berkeley Bowl or something, right? It's, it's surprising how hot they get. So thermoelectrics would have the ability to m take that waste heat and change it into useful electricity to mitigate the energy demands of the car and power electronics and do things like that. Now, it's just for vehicles, but you can imagine the, the broader implications here. Now, the problem is that most thermoelectric materials are built out of sort of hard rock-like things. And heat goes out in every direction. So it's hard to capture, okay? So we've built new kinds of materials for thermoelectrics that are built out of both the rocks and the polymers. And they're amazing in the fact that they can conform to any shape you can imagine, like wrapping around this engine to grab heat very efficiently in all directions and to actually use that um, for some of these sort of really interesting and, and intricate and difficult to use applications for standard materials. So it's a case where this material synergy has allowed us to realize a totally new function in a material um, that you really couldn't do with any of them on their own. And these are the kinds of problems that I get excited about and it's why I like working at the lab and on fun topics like this. Thank you. All right, just beat the buzzer. Just beat the buzzer. Uh, a pill to treat those exposed uh, to radioactive materials. Let's hope that we never need to use such a thing, but if we do, we have someone working on that problem as well. Please welcome Rebecca Abergel. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and to tell you about what my team does at Berkeley Lab. Um, so we are developing a new oral therapeutic to treat people that will be internally contaminated with radionuclides. And there are two major concepts in this big idea. There is the pill concept and the radioactive concept. And I'm going to start with the radioactive part because it's probably the scarier one. So we have a lot of radioactive materials around us. Um, it's used pretty much in everyday life. In nuclear medicine, think diagnostic imaging, radiotherapy, it's used in industrial processes for energy production. It's used in the research lab. Um, it's used in little devices that are in your kitchen, smoke detectors. So most often, radioactive materials are more helpful than harmful, but that's because they're very well contained. And so problems happen when they start spreading. And you've seen this kind of images, I'm sure you have, um, or at least you were thinking about it. That's um, the catastrophic image that um, we picture for nuclear disasters, and you're probably thinking about the Chernobyl ev event, uh, Three Miles Island, Fukushima, that happened a little more than two years ago. So really, um, we can um, see this kind of cloud of radioactive particles form, and in that case, it's very hard to prevent the fallout, and people will eventually ingest or inhale radioactive materials, and this is where it starts becoming harmful. And so, we don't want those, those events to happen, but we have to mitigate the contamination if it happens. And how do we do this? So this is pretty much um, the shielding around here. <laughs> but it's probably very good shielding, but this is not what we use. So at the lab, we focus on um, those elements down there um, in the periodic table, the lanthanides and the actinides. They're F elements, and they have very specific properties. Their coordination chemistry is very specific, and we use it in our research. 
Um, I'll just do a PR action there. There are a lot of those elements that were um, discovered at Berkeley. There's Berkelium that was discovered at Berkeley Lab. We, we do target uranium, plutonium, americium, so you've probably heard of those elements. Um, all the actinides are radioactive. The lanthanides, um, some of them come as radioactive isotopes. Uh, most of them are found in nuclear processes. So we do target those elements. And we do this by designing molecules that will chelate them. They will target them, they're metal ions. They will bind those metals through, for the chemists out, out there, through the oxygen atoms that are highlighted in red. They will form very stable complexes that are much easier to excrete. They're more soluble than the contaminants themselves, and so once we've targeted from the complex, we can get rid of the contaminant. And so this is not only chemistry in the test tube. We do have to do some proof of concept experiments, and we do this using an animal model. We do inject mice with radioactive isotopes, and in this particular case, it's plutonium. And then we give them our treatment, and we do follow the radioactivity in the body and in the excretion so that we know where it's going, how fast it's coming out, and how it's coming out. And so in this particular proof of concept experiment, we're looking at plutonium that's left in the body after 24 hours. And our control animals um, are those animals that were contaminated with plutonium, but we didn't give them any treatment. And so you see that about 90% of the plutonium that was injected is still in the body after 24 hours. And it tends to deposit there for the long term. So you find them, uh, you find the plutonium in the, the skeleton, that's the gray area. You find it in the liver, that's the red area, in the soft tissues, in the kidneys. When we give them our treatment, in this particular case, it's only once, we can go down to about 15% left. So that's a dramatic decrease in plutonium content after 24 hours, and that's only a single dose. So this is a proof of concept experiment. Um, and this is where the real work starts. On average, um, drugs need about a billion dollars and 15 years to get from the research bench to the marketplace. Hopefully we'll go faster than this. But um, our work really relies on three pillars now. Um, one of them is formulation, one of them is efficacy, and one of them is safety. So the first one, formulation, um, this leads me back to what I mentioned earlier. Uh, we were developing a pill. If there is a large event of contamination, so a lot of people contaminated in a big metropolitan area, we don't want to be handing out needles and tell them to inject themselves. We want to be giving pills that are easy to take, easy to crush to give children or older people. So we're doing a lot of um, work to formulate this compound as a pill. Once this is done, we have to test this, its efficacy, and we cannot contaminate people on purpose. That's not really ethical, right? So we're not gonna do clinical trials where we give plutonium to people. Um, so we have to test this in animal models, and we do um, test the efficacy of our drug. We have to understand how much of the drug we need to give, um, how long we need to give it for, if we give a single dose every day for 20 days, or a single dose every day for a year. Um, when do we stop? When do we know that most of it has come out? So that's the efficacy part. Then there is the safety. We do need to test the safety. We can't just give it to people. We need to understand that there are no side effects, there is no toxicity, so there will be a clinical trial just to test the safety. So all this data that we're gathering, we, need to, we really just need to confirm that this is a safe drug and it's actually working. And so once we've done this, hopefully soon, we can tell the Food and Drug Administration that we can use it, but hopefully we will never have to use it. And so um, it's a lot of work, and I need to point out that um, there are a lot of people working um, on this project. There are a lot of different collaborations out there, and it will take um, more than eight, six minutes to list all of them. Um, but this is definitely team science, and hopefully it will be cheaper, faster, and we'll get there, and you will never have to use our drugs. But thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. So our seventh presenter is now going to take us deep into the universe and expand our minds, and I will let Peter Nugent explain exactly how he's going to do that. Thank you. In eight minutes, this will be a challenge. So I'm here to tell you about supernova. Uh, supernova are the most impressive, the largest explosions in the universe. A typical supernova will explode 
rise in a couple weeks' time, fall again to about a hundredth of the brightness that it reaches a peak, and then decay away for years. The supernova explosion starts off incredibly hot, 100,000 degrees, cooling quickly to 50, 10,000 degrees at peak brightness, and then fading away till it's only a couple thousand degrees. Supernova explosion is so bright that even though a galaxy will contain well over a billion stars, the supernova will actually outshine for a few weeks all the rest of the stars in the galaxy. In fact, if you look at the energy output just within a month of peak brightness, a typical supernova will outshine all the light produced by our sun in its 10 billion years. So they're massive, massive explosions. They come in two flavors. One comes from the death of a massive star, a star 10 to 100 times the mass of our sun. The star burns hydrogen to helium, helium to carbon and oxygen, all the way up through silicon, calcium to iron. When it gets there, it can't burn anymore, and the pressure increases on this iron core as it builds up and builds up to the point where the protons and electrons in the iron get smooshed together, form a neutron, and the core collapses. And the core collapses to a neutron star that's only about the size of the city of Berkeley. And yet it weighs 1.4 times the mass of our sun. Okay? This happens in an instant, and when it does, it releases a tremendous amount of energy that disrupts the entire star. Now there's another type of supernova, a thermonuclear supernova, which where the star isn't quite as massive. It's only a couple times the mass of our sun or so, and it burns its hydrogen and helium to carbon and oxygen, and then it stops. Now if it has a companion, it can pull material over if they're close enough, and it continues to burn up to carbon and oxygen, and there's a special mass called the Chandrasekhar mass, which is just a bit above the mass of our sun, and if it gets there, the temperatures and densities get hot enough in the center to ignite a massive thermonuclear explosion. The explosion is so large that if you took all of the thermonuclear weapons ever made on Earth, put them together, and lit them off at once, you'd have to multiply it by a one with 22 zeros after it in order to get the amount of energy that's released in one of these explosions. Now, they're very bright. You can see these almost all the way across the visible universe. And occasionally, they occur in a galaxy like ours. In our galaxy, a supernova will go off about once every 100 years. The last time we've had one was about 400 years ago, so we're due, okay? Here is a very impressive one that occurred in the year 1054, and it was so impressive that this is a petroglyph uh, that the Anasazi uh, Native Americans made in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, which shows a crescent moon, a star, and a hand. And on July 4th, 1054, if you put your hand out, and walked over two hands from the crescent moon, you would see this supernova, which came here that we've now seen a thousand years later. They're impressively bright. This supernova and the other seven or so that have been recorded in history are bright enough that you can read a book at night by them, that you can see them in the daytime. Okay, so why do we study supernova? Everything that you're looking at in this room is a product of the supernova explosion. The stars burn their hydrogen and helium on up to iron, but to get it out there everywhere else, you have to have one of these explosions. So everything from the calcium in our bone, the silicons in the glass lens, the gold in my teeth, okay, I have a few cavities, okay, that is the product of a supernova explosion. Another reason that we study supernova is because a certain type of them, the thermonuclear ones, they tend to go off at the same mass every single time. Not a bit more, not a bit less, and they are what we call standard candles. Not only are they a massive thermonuclear bomb, but they explode about the same way every single time. And so we can use them to measure distances from their relative brightness and measure how the universe has expanded since the Big Bang. And in 2011, a Nobel Prize was awarded for work that was done at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and uh, over in Australia uh, for the measurement of the accelerating universe. We observed supernova that were about eight billion light years away, and we were able to tell that not only was the universe expanding and that there was gravity, but there was something counteracting gravity causing this expansion to speed up. We now call that dark energy, okay? So how do we find a supernova? 
Supernova, the distant ones that we found back in the 90s are actually pretty easy, okay? Everybody just imagine a camera. I'm taking a picture, say, on the top of the Berkeley Hills. I have a friend right in front of me, okay? And I put you in the lens, and I want San Francisco in the background. It's a pretty easy thing to do. But what do you notice if you look at the number of people that span your field of view? The farther away you go, the more people are in the picture, okay? You get the whole of San Francisco, hundreds of thousands of people. You get one person right in front of you. Well, this is the problem we have. We're very good at finding the things that blow up very far away. The reason being, there's more stuff there to blow up. We get a supernova that goes off about once every 100 years, okay, in a galaxy like ours. Well, if I stare at 100 galaxies for a year, I'll find one supernova. Not good enough for me. I'm impatient. I want to find one every night. So what do we got to do? We got to stare at about 365,000 galaxies, okay, every single night, okay? So we have a camera at the Palomar Ocean Schmidt Telescope. These are camera images, which are eight megapixels, pretty standard. Uh, the resolution, one pixel, is about the width of a dime at one mile, okay? And we can measure just a couple of photons at a time that hit it. That's how sensitive we are. Uh, this gives you an idea of how big this imager covers the sky. The moon's about a half a degree. This is eight square degrees. And in one of these individual images, most of the splotches you see here are galaxies at about a billion light years away. Here's one that's a little bit closer than that. This is a reference image. We take this at about oh, two weeks to a year before. We go take a new image, and then we use computers to do a subtraction. And there we find a supernova, very young, going off in a galaxy. Now, if you look here, you can see there are a lot of splotches around there. For every image that we take, we get about 1,000 pieces of junk in there, OK, that have nothing to do with supernova. We take 3,000 of these images every single night. We process them on a supercomputer because it's about a terabyte of data coming in. And we want to find these things very, very quickly, okay? Minutes after the image is taken. So every image comes in, we process it, we scan those images with computer programs that look for the things that pop out, and boom, there we find our supernova. For every one supernova we find, we have to sift through a million objects that are worthless. And here's one of the more impressive ones that we found in 2011, 2011 FE. It was in a galaxy not too far away, and the supernova was bright enough to see it with binoculars. What I'm waiting for is the one that goes off in our galaxy so I can go read a book outside at night by it. Thanks. Wow. Very good. Thank you, Peter. So our last presenter, Ian Hinchcliffe, uh, is going to tell us about how the universe works and, more importantly, why we should care. Uh, but uh, because we've saved some time and because we have a little extra, we're going to give him a, a little addendum. We're going to go past the eight minutes. I don't think you'll mind. A couple of extra minutes on Ian's. I think you'll find it worth it. Well, please welcome Ian. Hi, I'm Ian Hinchliffe, a senior physicist at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and a collaborator on one of the two experiments that found the Higgs boson uh, a year ago. So I'm pleased to be in the Berkeley Rep giving this talk because I now have two things in common with one of these gentlemen, Patrick Stewart. He stood there, sat in a chair right there. Uh, and we were born in the same small town in England. So three weeks ago, you may have uh, noticed that the Higgs boson was given a, a, the Nobel Prize. Uh, it was given to Mr. Peter Higgs and Francoise Anglaire for work they did in 1964, almost 50 years ago. So it's a legitimate question to ask, you know, what took so long? Uh, they did this thing years ago. What, were they all asleep in Stockholm? No, they weren't all asleep, but of course, until last year, the summer of 2012, uh, it was just a theory. There was no evidence that, the, that their theory was right. And in the summer of, of 2012, the Higgs boson, which I'll describe a little in a moment, was discovered by two experiments at CERN, one of which, uh, one of which I'm a member of, uh, and there was this big fuss. People asked, why were we having it on the 4th of July, which is a holiday? It's not a holiday in Switzerland. <laughs> Right, so at the point, what we're trying to ask, uh, what's the, what am I interested in? What's the Higgs boson got to do with everyday life and, and you? Um, I'm asking the question, what are we all made of and how do we all work at a very fundamental level? Well, we're all flesh and blood, I think. Um, 
And inside that, that means we're all atoms, molecules. And inside atoms, there are protons and neutrons and uh, electrons. And inside that, the very fundamental objects are electrons and the things that build up nuclei, the quarks. And we think those are point-like objects. And that's what we sort of know now. There's a picture of, of a helium atom, to give you some idea of, of, of what I'm talking about. And if this nucleus were the size of this uh, room here, the atom would extend out somewhat beyond the Farallon Islands. So this is not to scale. Right, so the fundamental questions that I'm interested in and I'm trying to address are that we discovered lots of particles over the last 50 years. What do they have to do with each other? Why are some of them heavier than others? What, where does the mass come from? Um, that's the first question. The second question is, if I do astrophysics experiments of the type talked about by my uh, previous speaker, and I look and ask in the rest of the universe, what's it made of? It's not really made, mostly, of the same stuff that we're made of. So what's the rest of this stuff? The third question that I'd like to know the answer to is why are we here at all, in the sense that if I start with a very hot early universe, I would expect that all the particles and all the antiparticles have annihilated, there's nothing left. But we're still here. So those are the, the three questions. And after the Mr. Higgs and uh, the LHC experiments, we've answered the first of these uh, three questions. So now here's a blank slide. And the reason for a blank slide is I have to explain to you what a Higgs boson is. And I can do this in two ways. I can have 50 slides uh, full of equations, or I can try a speech and a blank slide. So I'm going to try the speech and the blank slide. Okay. So the Higgs mechanism, which is underlies this theory, is a mechanism which gives mass to all the particles. So you guys are the Higgs field everybody sitting here, and I'm a particle who's trying to get mass by interacting with you guys. So if I need to get to the back of the room, I have to climb over all the seats. It takes me a hell of a long time to get there because I've interacted with everybody. I'm slow, therefore I'm heavy. If I run up the aisle, there's less obstruction. I can get to the back faster, and therefore I'm a lighter particle. I have less interaction with you guys, I weigh less. That's how the Higgs mechanism works. It gives mass to all the particles by interacting with them. Now, Higgs, however, predicted a Higgs boson. What's that? I want to get a message to the guy sitting in the back row I can't see because these lights are too bright. Um, I could do it by speaking to you and asking you to tell the person behind you, and eventually a message would get back to the back of the room. It would take a while. Um, but I wouldn't have to go there myself. So the propagation of that message in the Higgs field is a Higgs boson, essentially. So it's a collective phenomenon of you guys. Right, so I now need to make a Higgs, but I've got to prove this is not just a theory. So in order to prove it's not just a theory, I have to make Higgs boson, I have to detect it. So to make one, I need a particle accelerator. I take two protons, I bash them together, all this junk comes out. I look at the stuff, and I try to infer that I actually produced a Higgs boson in this mess. So for that, I need a, a machine, and it's not very easy to produce a Higgs boson, as you can see from this number. Whoops, I knew I would do that. As you can see from this... Uh, number, which I can't pronounce at the bottom, uh, you have to do it many, many times before you actually find anything. So the machine is in Switzerland, it's just outside Geneva, and it's buried underground, and this gives you some idea of the scale of the Large Hadron Collider. This is an airport you can just see up at the top there, with the airport runway visible. So that gives you an idea of the scale. And there are four detectors which will look at the remnants from the collision that I just showed you, and try to infer the existence of the Higgs boson. I'm on one of those collaborations, which is a worldwide collaboration. This is our collaboration map with every country on which we have collaborators colored in. The detector sits underground, quite close to the CERN main gate. Um, it's about half the size of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Uh, there's a little person standing there, which gives you an idea of the scale. Uh, the Thing in the very center, the very smallest thing which you can't see in this, uh, this picture, is the thing that was built by the people here in Berkeley. It's the most precise part of the detector. So it may be the smallest, but it's also the most important because it has the most precision and it's closest to the point where the Higgs gets produced. So here's a video. So this is how it works. So hydrogen atoms are taken from a bottle. They're slowly accelerated by being passed through a sequence of magnets and uh, electric fields which slowly inject much more energy. 
And then they're finally injected into the LHC tunnel, which is shown there, at the, and they're going to collide at some point. So now we go inside the tunnel. Uh, somebody's written some graffiti there on the wall, which some of you might recognize. So there's a superconducting magnet. Inside the superconducting magnets, we have a beam of protons. In a minute, it'll go, there we are. So here's inside the proton, which you can think of as being three quarks. These are circulating in opposite directions. They're about to collide in the atlas detector, which is now coming into view. Uh, you see the two incoming things. They smash together. A whole bunch of junk comes out. There it goes. And out of this junk, there are four particular particles which are colored in, and those are the products of a Higgs decay. So this is a simulation except for the end, where a real physics event has been overlaid on top of it. Um, and now somebody's helped you by drawing in the lines of the four objects that the Higgs boson decayed into. So that's what I'm about. And now I'm going to answer the question as to uh, what use is it. Well, as you've probably noticed in this stream of talks, I'm the most obscure of all the speakers in the sense I'm the one who's least connected to reality. I guess that's why they put me, <laughs> that's why they put me at the end. I know. So it's very difficult to explain why people do fundamental research. You do it because you're trying to learn things that are new. You're not doing it because I'm trying to build a meta mousetrap. If I wanted to build a meta mousetrap, I would build a rent a mousetrap. So <laughs> apart from the last person in this chain, which I'm going to go through, they were all doing uh, fundamental research. The last person was not. So you take discoveries made by all these people, you put them together, and you get some common thing, which I will ask the audience to name when I finished making the speech. So the person up on the top left is Alessandro Volta, who was working in 1790 uh, with sheets of metal and um, cloths uh, soaked in sulfuric acid. And, at that, and he made the first battery, what we would now call the first battery. Totally useless, because he had nothing to connect it to. <laughs> the next person is Michael Faraday, who was doing research in the 1830s. And he was looking at the electrical properties of materials, having figured out that he could connect Volta's battery to that. Um, one of the things he discovered that well, there were some materials with rather strange properties, which we now call semiconductors. Remember, we're still in the steam age. Nobody knows anything about electricity. And at this point, you might want to ask yourself, if you were voting for somebody from Congress in these ancient years, would you have voted for somebody who would have voted to fund the research of these people or not? Because if your answer is, I would not have voted to fund the research, you're not allowed to have the object, which is under the question mark at the end. The third person is Ada Lovelace, who is regarded as the first person to write a computer program. This is about 1840. Totally useless, because she had no computer on which to run it. The person on the bottom left is Heinrich Hertz, uh, who in the 1880s decided to do an experiment to test one of the predictions of electromagnetic theory, which had been developed in the 19th century. And one of these predictions was the existence of what we now call radio. So Hertz built a small experimental apparatus in his laboratory, produced a radio signal, and then detected it. The next person is, of course, Einstein. Everybody recognizes Einstein. And uh, in 1916, Einstein came up with the theory of general relativity, which everybody says has absolutely nothing to do with everyday life. Certainly, Einstein thought that. But I'm afraid these days you couldn't be more wrong, because whenever you drive anywhere, you all use GPS in order not to get lost. And if you don't know if the person who uh, programmed the GPS doesn't know about general relativity, the GPS system would have a lifetime of about three minutes. It would become totally useless after about three minutes. So the last person on this list is somebody who was trying to design something that was of immediate use. That's Tim Berners-Lee, who was working at CERN, where the Higgs was discovered, in about 1989. And he was trying to devise a system which enabled scientists distributed all over the world to communicate in a more efficient manner, both technical information. Uh, so he's, in some sense, the origin of the World Wide Web. So you have battery, semiconductor, computer program, wireless, GPS, and World Wide Web. And the answer is? Thank you. Thank you.
All right, so now, how many of you want to join the Berkeley Lab team, right? Okay? So the scientists can join us on stage. We're going to put some chairs out. We're going to do our Q&A in uh, just a couple of minutes. Let's round of applause for these guys. They did a fantastic job. Okay? All right, well, let's, we're going to start with questions. Uh, let's start with this gentleman right here. Is this on? Yes. To Jeff Urban. You have now hydrogen and magnesium combined in a way that nicely stores hydrogen. How do you get it out? <laughs> Does it require energy to do that? You, Jeff, you can sit. You can ah, sit. OK. Uh, g gently. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, so actually, it's very nice. Uh, you get to control by the size and the chemistry of it how strongly it connects to it. So what you want to actually is to use just a gentle amount of heat to release it or a gentle amount of vacuum. Nowadays, because the materials aren't terribly optimized, you either have to go to very, very low temperatures, minus sort of 70 degrees, or to very, very high temperatures to coax it out. And that's another part of the thermodynamic inefficiency of everything as it operates now. So to, to get close to room temperature, but to need a, 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 little, a little tweak is, is really ideal. But then it, it won't take an excessive amount of energy to get it back out again, to get the hydrogen out? Yeah, that's, that's the best part. So you want to put in as little energy as possible in order to extract the useful energy. Thank you for your question. Let's take the gentleman over here. <laughs> um, well, I'd much rather a young, young uh, person ask the question, but I, I'm going to be a heavy about this. And I want to ask, uh, I would like to ask each of you, but I, I, I want to ask anyone who, who, who wants to uh, share with us what uh, nightmare scenarios he would have for how industry or uh, a not so friendly uh, political neighbor could uh, misuse your application. I hate to do this, but it must be done. So how, okay, everyone clear? Misuse your applications? Yeah, it's really hard to pull a uh, white dwarf over here to blow it up, so <laughs> for me at least, I think we're pretty safe. Um, don't know about anybody else. And I'm safe also because the LHC is not going to destroy the world. Anyone else? Well, I'm, I'm developing something so that somebody who wants to misuse previous discoveries um, um, cannot do this. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Dr. Bowen, um, I'm very impressed with your results. Uh, that said, what, what do you think the real clinical applications of the instrument you proposed are in terms of not only its complexity, but in terms of its in vivo versus uh, ex vivo applications? Great question. So currently, Research laboratories are using this uh, technology as a proof of principle measurement to look at drug metabolism. So that's a quite simple application of mass spectrometry imaging. You're looking for one molecule that you give to an organism, and then what that molecule breaks down into, and then which tissues the molecule eventually ends up in. And that information is allowing research labs to make safer drugs and more targeted drugs. companies uh, interested in what you're doing? Well, so that's what's interesting about OpenMSI is that because we're in the cloud, they don't really want to just open their data up to the public <laughs> right now. But uh, hopefully in the future we'll have a security layer so that we could collaborate with those types of institutions as well. Thanks. Any question over here? I have three. I'll oh. start out with the uh, Computer. Let's start with, let's do your first one and let's see how, how it goes. Okay, with the um, treatment for uh, radiation, would that also work with uh, radiation uh, in outer space that we could, would run into? No, we're only looking at 
internal contamination, not such as with cosmic rays. They don't get in. It's not a radioactive material that comes internal. It's just hitting you. <laughs> so that would be a different treatment. Okay. Uh, number two for the supercomputers. How did you come across those materials? Was it just trial and error, or was it? Yeah. So we have to give them a starting guess. And what we do is that we start from the known materials, the known crystal structures, and then we substitute all kinds of other materials or atoms into those crystal structures. So we throw at them 100,000 candidates. And then they tell us what the properties are, and we pull down, we look at you know, which one fulfill the criteria we have. And then we iterate, depending on what, what was a hit, what was a good one, and then we maybe tweak that a bit, throw it back in, try some different things. It's a bit of an iterative process, but you've got to start with some guesses. Interesting. And the third would be for uh, supernovas. I have heard recent reports that they used to think all materials came after supernovas, but now they're now, the more recent research shows that they come from uh, dead uh, stellar cores that had merged together. Which ones? Uh, which ones are correct, or are they both correct, and what are the mechanisms involved in making the um, elements heavier than iron? So they're, they're both correct. Um, the other one results, uh, the merger of two stars can result in a massive supernova explosion like the one I described, or it can result in a dud where you won't see anything optically, but it will still release a lot of energy at other wavelengths. Uh, and the mechanism for building things beyond iron uh, basically, when the shock wave runs through one of these massive stars, uh, it can actually cause uh, an R process nucleosynthesis reaction, which can then build up uh, by putting other particles together with it to things all the way to uranium. So we can even see uranium in stars uh, that are the process of a shock wave going through a supernova. And what are the mechanisms and reference points that we could obtain for that? Uh, reference points in terms of what? In terms of what they produce? Yes, the pathways. Uh, so it's, it's very similar to the uh, open MSI uh, type work. We take spectra of these supernovae, and in a very similar way, uh, we can study the elements which they ejected. Wow. Thank you for your question. I think there's a young gentleman right there in a red T-shirt. Uh, um, well, I have a bunch of questions, <laughs> so I suppose I'll start I from there first. You are a regular, are you not? Um, well, for Ben Bowen, um, why not, is there any way to make a mass spectrometer that doesn't, that isn't destructive to the materials it creates? For example, you might want to run various tests, or would it, is it just you have to run the mass spectrometry last? So that's a great question. Yeah, so I, as you clearly saw that the, when the laser beam hits the tissue, it destroys the tissue, those holes you saw in the image in the tissue. So what we typically do is take two sections of the same tissue that are extremely close to each other in space so that one section is just right after another. So they're lined up with each other and you can use the second section to do different types of analysis on with other types of microscopy. Uh -huh, so you're, t you're taking one half for one type for exactly. the mass spectroscopy and the other for others. And um, for um, Peter Erceus, um, I don't know, um, <laughs> would this um, identification of, like the, of the various this, this, errors in the nanoparticles, might that be used in criminal investigations? For example, there was a droplet of some material on the person's, on the uh, uh, attacker's arm or something, and it drops off and it's found in a garbage bin. Might the various differences in the material, might they be used to identify? Those kind of things, the, the things that we look at are a little bit more basic than that. So you probably wouldn't use that kind of technique to look at um, droplets of blood or something like that that would identify an attacker. This would be more to identify properties in the material that we could use to make bigger or better airplanes or better batteries, things like that. Uh -huh. um, 
and from um, Shung Wok Lee. <laughs> Does this um, effect have anything to do with the flagella of bacteria? Uh, basically, the bacteria is uh, one of the host cells for our viruses. So therefore, we engineer these viruses and then intercept the bacteria. And then therefore, we can produce a lot of the uh, virus in instead of the bacteria. Mm -hmm. so but therefore I'm, I'm thinking of like, does the flagella of a bacteria, does it run on the same principle? Uh, basically, the, all the life form have uh, exactly the same principle. So therefore, the, all the DNA, uh, protein, and all the basic the kind of building block is uh, piezoelectric. So therefore, our cell is also piezoelectric. But when we induce in the right condition, we can produce all this type of the energy. Uh -huh. And um, for our, um, uh, Jeff Urban, um, for the hydrogen economy, you're thinking of what in I'm, do you, have you considered the infrastructure changes that might be required to switch to a hydrogen economy? Uh, I, I have been involved in those conversations, and I, I'd love to talk to you about them offline. Um, obviously, anytime you switch to a different fuel source, it's it's a big deal. Um, so, you know. It, there's a lot of moving parts involved. We do actually have a hydrogen infrastructure in Emeryville where I live, um, and we actually have hydrogen buses that run all around. There's a fueling station right near where I live. Oh. So I'm going to ask you to hold your uh, next question so we can get to someone else. We can come back to you. This gentleman over here. Hi. Um, I uh, note that uh, about half of you are foreign born and have come to the United States to do science. Um, I know a few scientists, and they all profess a certain amount of frustration, as you've alluded to uh, with the congressional shutdown. Dr. Hinchcliffe, you also referred to that lowest form of intelligence, the congressman, um, trying to, to justify your audience. research to people who really don't get the idea of basic research. I'm wondering, as a country, and I, I direct this to the scientists who are foreign born who've come here, and those of you who are here and apparently want to stay, voting with your feet, are we doing science right? Are we doing it wrong? Are we getting worse? Could we be doing it better? And if so, how? And that's open to the floor. Yes. Well, we haven't heard from him. He's probably going to ask some more, so we're going to hold off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, resources are always finite, so there's always competition for funding between us as well as between us and the rest of the world. Uh, yes, there should be more money in science. Uh, I'd like it if it came in my direction, but to be honest, if it came in the direction of anybody, anybody here, I would be very pleased about that. Um, you have to argue that, 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 as you correctly said, the source of funding these days is political. Historically, it often wasn't. Uh, you could find a rich benefactor. These days, rich benefactors are not usually rich enough to be able to afford to subsidize science, although some do. And there are scientific foundations funded by entrepreneurs, for example. So these days, it's government. The mechanisms are different in Europe than they are in the US, but it's just as difficult to get funding there. I would say the main difference between us and colleagues in Europe is it's easier to do long-term planning in Europe than it is in the US. And I would like to say that um, generically across all of our fields, a lot of the endeavors that we pursue are very expensive and almost beyond the expense of any one government on the planet can do. And so that is why we are involved in a lot of international collaborations. And just as you see international people here, if you go over to any of the institutes in Europe, you will see many Americans there as well. So it is the fact that we work together on these projects we find it easy to travel to these places, and then a lot of people just decide to stay wherever they wind up. If I can make a cultural comment, one of the most great things about working at CERN, from my point of view, is you get to meet all these people from all over the world on a regular basis. So, we, you know, we think of ourselves, we don't think of ourselves as US scientists or European scientists, we're just scientists. Anyone else like to comment on that question? On the panel? No? Okay. okay. We have another question. Uh, yeah. Let's. Um, this is for Shang Wukli. 
Uh, I'm wondering, is there any way that we could ever do mass electricity generation with this bacteria to a point where you could power houses or cities? So your question is, uh, can we produce a mass scale of these viruses? Yeah. So basically, if you go to the, the Napa Valley, so we have a really huge scale of the fermenter. So therefore, we believe that these viruses are basically cultured in the bacteria, you know, that kind of big the fermenters. So therefore, we can easily scale up these viruses in our mass productions. So good thing is that we only need the really few viruses, thin layers of these viruses to pr produce electricity. So therefore, we, we can basically uh, utilize all these resources to produce a uh, mass scale of the energy. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Over here. Dr. Hinchliffe, so uh, I've heard that the uh, LHC is going to be uh, upgraded to higher energies by 2014, and I've also heard of the new research where they've created like glass um, plates with ridges to focus particles. Will the LHC use any of that in its upgrade? Are you planning on that, or is, it, is that research not relevant to okay. what you're doing? We are in the process, the machine is down at the moment, we are in the process of doing maintenance and upgrade, and as you correctly say, about 18 months from now, we will come back on with about twice the energy that um, we currently have. The topic of research that you're alluding to is uh, thinking about next generation accelerators. They wouldn't be used in the LHC, but it might be used, for example, in some future accelerator. The goal of all accelerator physicists is to reduce the size of an accelerator which effectively means you want to have a, a, an electric field with a larger field gradient. And that's one of the, the things that people are working on, of the sort of thing you in, uh, indicated. Okay, thanks for your question. Now, this young lady over you. here. Thank you. So first of all, I would just want to thank all of the scientists here this evening. I think you've re-enkindled my interest and passion for science that my junior year physics teacher killed in high school. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. And I'm thrilled to see all the women up here, too. And I had a quick question for uh, Dr. Abergel. Um, so I understand that there are ethical issues with uh, testing on human beings, but I was just wondering, um, has there been any consideration, since we do have scientists um, who are uh, suffering in Fukushima uh, because of all their exposure to the radioactive um, waste uh, from the nuclear reactor meltdown. Has there been any discussion about or interest by those folks uh, as, being, um, as being willing to test out what you're working on? Well, besides Fukushima, there, you know, it, you can go back to Chernobyl, there are still people alive. And um, it's very hard to control studies in this case because you wouldn't know what the exposure was or you'd have to estimate it. Um, and then you wouldn't be able to start the treatment whenever you want to start it. You would have maybe one person in that situation, another one in this one. And um, a clinical trial requires really a lot of people, a lot of power, so you get statistical significance. It would be very hard to do this. Um, some, some drugs are being used just empirically. <laughs> Um, there are some countries where scientists just inject themselves <laughs> with um, the stuff. It, you know, you can imagine a lot of scenarios. Um, they're probably all being um, happening, but we, it would be very hard to just give a controlled data set to the FDA and say it's been used in humans. Thank you. Thank you. This gentleman's been waiting patiently up here. I'm sorry I didn't see you earlier. Um, um, on modeling and looking at atoms, since wait, we're now using Hold on one second, please. This gentleman up, up high in, in the... <laughs> Uh, also, I want to thank you for incredibly concise, brief things on something. Some things I'm sure are just they take up a huge amount of your time, and you're trying to com you know to put it down to eight minutes. And all of you did so well. I'm just really impressed. Yeah. <laughs> um, my wife and I, when we first came in and looked at the list, said, "What's the thread that's you know kind of holding you guys together?" And and we didn't see it kind of on first glance. Do you guys, do you guys ever? hang out together in the, in the lunchroom and say, oh, you know that virus stuff. I have a material, I mean, I wonder if you guys, how much, uh, maybe this is the first time you've ever seen each other, I don't know. <laughs> but do you guys get to collaborate? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll say actually, just backstage, we had uh, you know, the, the circumstance where we recognized each other from another um, lab function that was encouraged you know, for, to help young leaders find their way. And, 
you know, science is a very small community. There are probably, you know, more plumbers in California maybe than scientists. So I, I've actually interacted with, with almost everyone on stage in some format or another and, and heard about their ideas. It's, it's a fun community. Yeah. Um, on modeling and looking at atoms, since we're now using electrons to observe these atoms, I noticed that all of the pictures were white. Is there any way to identify the colors of the atoms? Can we still use photons to um, get a reading on what color they might be? Actually, you can use electrons to do the same thing. It's called spectroscopy, and you do a very similar thing to light. So if you pass white light through a prism, you get the, the light splits into, into the different colors. And each one of those colors is a different wavelength of light, OK? And so white light actually is composed of all the different colors all in one. And electrons have the same thing. When an electron passes through a material, it will lose energy to that material, and it will go to slightly different, it will have a slightly different wavelength. And we can use a, a, a type of magnet called a bending magnet that will change the path length of all of these different electrons. And then we can disperse them based on their energy. So we can actually do, uh, we can actually color electron pictures as well oh, in the exact same way. And the, the best thing about that is you can tell the difference between a silicon, a piece of silicon, a piece of gold, a piece of um, all, all kinds of different materials that you want to look at so that we can say this type of material is here and this type of material is there, even Thanks. on the atomic scale. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I'm not sure, are you waiting up high to ask the question? Yes, please. Um, this is for Dr. Abigail. Uh, for the drug that you guys are developing, has there been any negative consequences as of it, like combining the wrong substances by accident? I'm sorry, I, I don't think I got. I, oh, so if we have if we have accidents at the lab. Oh no! Like uh, in the mice, have it has it combined the wrong substances in the body? Uh, well, we so far everything looks good. So so far we <laughs> we've. The, the one drug that we're developing right now comes, no, they, none of them have died, but um, we've, we've tested quite a lot of compounds before <laughs> um, that were quite toxic or didn't work out as well as we thought they would. Um, so right now the compound that was selected is coming out of a pretty large screening, um, but none of the animals have died, everything looks good. Um, that's what we keep going. Next question here. Um, I have a question for Dr. Christine Person. Person. Um, so your prediction is, upon, is based on the fact that we completely understand the magnetism when two elements that never been combined together. So are we already that smart, like know exactly how they work? Also, uh, sometimes a new, dis uh, new material is discovered because it works on the, a completely new way that cannot be calculated or predicted based on the known knowledge. That's why it's so surprising, for example, like superconductor. We just cannot predict because they work in completely new way. So. so you're absolutely right. If we don't understand what, um, if we don't have a theory for where a particular property is coming from, we can't calculate it. Uh, but we do, ha there are a lot of properties of materials that we can calculate, that we have a descriptive theory for. Um, and we've had it for a long time, actually. We just didn't have the computers to be able to do it that fast. When I started as a grad student, we could only do single elements, metals. So, and that was many years ago, but anyway. <laughs> um, in, in that time span, the computers have gotten so much faster that we can now calculate very, quite complicated properties of materials in a very short time span. And the algorithms have gotten slightly better, too. But you're absolutely right. If we don't understand it, we cannot calculate it. Sometimes, though, we can get completely unexpected results that materials we would not have guessed to be good at a certain, certain application fall out of this because the computer doesn't care. It doesn't have any preconceived notions of what material should be good for this. It's agnostic. So that's one of the advantages. Thank you. Any questions? So this uh, question came in from somebody watching the video live stream, and I'm assuming it's for Ian. Uh, are, there, uh, are there particles smaller than quarks? And if so, what are quarks made of? There is no, ex we have no experimental evidence that, that there are particles smaller than a quark. We believe a quark has no uh, intrinsic size. It's just a point. So in that sense, it couldn't be made out of anything else. There are theoretical speculations or well, there have been in the past, but they're just that, speculations. There is no experimental evidence. 
And without evidence, the speculations are useless. There's also no reason uh, in our current understanding, we don't need anything else. The fact that the quark is point-like is enough. We don't need to postulate any other properties. Thank you, live stream audience person. Yes. Um, this is for Peter Newton. Um, does dark energy have affect any other planets or stars? Uh, so uh, when I first, when we first started looking at this and saying, oh, there, there's got to be dark energy out there, we tried to calculate the effect on, say, the orbit of Pluto and how long would it take for us to see the effects of dark energy. And it was something like over a million years before we could measure it really well. So yes, dark energy is everywhere, um, but what dark energy works on most effectively is empty space. And even our solar system is considered chock full of stuff compared to the stuff between the galaxies and between the clusters of galaxies out there in the universe. And that's where dark energy has its major effect. We're upstairs now. Hi, um, this question is for Dr. Pearson specifically, but a lot of you mentioned collaboration internationally amongst yourselves, but also these kind of new kind of platforms where people can share information. And do you see a growing trend of people being open to sharing their research and their ideas with each other, kind of further it along? It's getting better, but we could do a lot better. <laughs> um, it takes time and effort to put your, not just to make your data discoverable, but also searchable. Uh, it, has to be, it has to be easy for people to reach it and to reach the relevant parts of your data, and that's actually not that easy, and a lot of scientists don't think it's worth the effort, right? They publish, they patent, they move on. Um, so I hope that's actually something we can do in influencing the, the, uh, the, the people who give us money, that it should always be a little part of that money to make it available to the public, um, to, to whoever wants to use it and you can't use that money for anything else. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to advocate that part. There should always be a tax for making it freely available. Can, can, I, come, can I comment on that? Um, I think we all try to make our uh, uh, results as visible as possible because we want other scientists to check them and reproduce them because that's the only way we actually know whether we got something right is if somebody else can, can get the same answer. Uh, and so, yes, we're strongly in favor of making all our data as available as possible so other people can play with it. However, it's not as simple as that because you might need a lot of very complicated software in order to analyze the data. And you wouldn't be able to write your own software. So we would have to provide that also. So it's not just the data, it's all the uh, equipment and all the other things that go with it that some other person trying to reproduce the data would also have, reproduce the result, would also have to have access to. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next question. We're going to uh, take maybe three or four more and then we're going to wrap okay. it up. Two, two questions. One is um, regarding the new materials. Do you, besides looking at the properties of materials, look at the human um, and environmental health impacts of those um, those materials and what they might have, what they might result in. For me or for the other people for, doing? For you. Yeah. Oh, for me. Oh, okay. Who, whomever. <laughs> okay. Um, so I would say to some degree, uh, when we go after, for example, if I go after a new battery material, uh, we exclude certain elements that we just know are going to be toxic. We don't even touch chromium four or five because we know it goes to six, and that's really bad. Um, the the mechanisms, if it's a very complicated mechanism that it influences um, environments, it can be hard to screen on. I, we do do it though. I have a person in my group who's screening organic molecules for in, environmental impact, but you have to know exactly what you're going for. In this particular case, it's combination of molecules in the atmosphere under certain temperatures. So he knows exactly which reaction to look for. Uh, so it's doable. It's definitely doable, but you've got to know to some degree what you're looking for. And I'll say from the experimentalist perspective, there's a, there's a huge enthusiasm and push in the community for earth abundant, you know, benign replacements for materials that are otherwise, um, you know, sort of non-optimal, so. And then for the moderator, a question is, um, I understand that trying to promote um, science, the interest in science and math in the schools is being considered by putting, showing scientists in television and movies. Do you ever get a request to advise um, productions of 
um, or showings of, tel of depictions of scientists in um, television and movies? Uh, we, uh, I think The Incredible Hope was actually filmed in the lab <laughs> before I came. Uh, that's actually, a, a, it, we, we don't, we're not usually asked, although individuals can be, I think, and probably have advised some various things, but we don't have an office per se. They might contact us, they might not. There actually is a, uh, in LA, the, uh, I think it was um, um, NIH set up an office, uh, which they do. And we, a, a few years ago, we did a Hollywood science show, and we worked with them to get some of the clips. So, but traditionally, not so much with us. Thanks for the question. There was a film partially at CERN a few years ago, uh, which I once saw on, a, on an airplane with the sound off. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's a, uh, there was a pro there's a problem sometimes with the, these movies that uh, they can try to make a good story and as a result they distort the science, the science so much wrong, that yes. you would rather have nothing to do with it. We did have a Vogue, we did have a Vogue fashion shoot one day at the Advanced Life Service. That did happen. Yes. Um, is <laughs> this question's for um, Ian Hinchliffe? Did I say that right? Okay. Tell me Heathcliff, so it's fine. Okay. <laughs> so you said that if something was moving s slow, it would be really heavy, and if it was moving fast, it would be lighter. Why is that? Well, it, as it, you have to be careful with the analogy that I gave you. It's just a story. I could have given you the 50 slides of mathematics instead. The 50 slides of mathematics would have been rigorous and you wouldn't have been able to poke holes in that. My little story, you can ask questions, intelligent questions like you just asked, which you cannot pursue, push a, a little story too much. But the, the, the idea is that if something is interacting very strongly, it has difficulty moving, and so it moves more slowly. And in some sense, heavy particles move more slowly than light particles if they have the same amount of energy. I've been very careful how I said that because I don't think I said anything wrong. And he can, con <laughs> and he can correct me if that's not true. So it's basically because a heavy particle, if it's interacting more, it has to force its way through. It will move more slowly if it has the same energy than a light particle. Uh, we're going to take one up high and then probably one more here and maybe just one more over here from someone who hasn't asked before. Like there's someone in that mix who hasn't asked a question. Okay. Thank you. So let's go upstairs first. So oh, this is here. For I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Dr. Abergel. Uh, with the treatment you're developing, are there any waste handling issues? Is, are the excretions inert? Or, um, and how would that, you know, on a large scale, if there was something in lots of people yeah. taking your treatment? I was hoping nobody would ask that. <laughs> You know, I think that's way down the line. Um, we're we're part of a, a bigger program um, that's called, it's pretty much for nuclear medical countermeasures um, and emergency, emergency response if there was a big event. And so I think I would just hand up the drug to the emergency responders. <laughs> I don't know what the plan is. Um, there would have to be. They, the, the I mean, we control everything. You know, of course, we dispose of waste as radioactive waste and, um, I don't know what the plan would be. So, so the excretions are radioactive. radioactive. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this gentleman up here. Sorry, didn't see you earlier. Uh, given that the scientists in general are striving for perfect communication and, and sharing of international uh, information, and corporate leaders and government leaders are just the opposite. They're trying to. Uh, keep their information to themselves or try to eavesdrop on each other to find that information. Do any of you have any political or corporate leadership aspirations? Or do you know of any other <laughs> scientists that have those aspirations? Because I think the world needs those type of people. I, I, well, I do know of other scientists. There, there was a congressman from New Jersey called Rush Holt who recently ran and lost in the Republican primary for the Senate in New Jersey. Democrat. Oh, sorry, Holt's Democratic, thank you very much. He lost to a, a Booker in the primary. So there are a few scientists in Congress, and there's one who represents a district near Chicago 
who used to work at Fermilab, which is the sort of US equivalent of CERN, if you like. So you're asking if any others here in the panel have political aspirations? I didn't, I didn't know. We need you. <laughs> Maybe they'll think about it. Thanks for the question. This gentleman here, please. This is for uh, Dr. Pearson. Uh, I was interested in your comment that uh, occasionally you will get some sort of unexpected result from a computer simulation of a material because the computers are agnostic. And of course, this is the sort of thing I assume you're really looking for is you know, unexpected results are a lot more valuable than expected results. But that raises the question, if you're, if you're really looking for unexpected results, how do you know where to look? Because uh, it's a combinatorial explosion. There, there, there are so many possible different combinations of things that you could look at uh, that even for uh, a computer simulation, it seems like it's an intractable problem. Yeah, it's, it's um, that, that is a very good point. Um, I would say, though, that in, in my field, the kind of uh, materials that I'm looking at, if you, if you constrain yourself to a crystal structure and atoms that go in certain places, there is actually a limit to how many materials we can make because there is a point where all these materials have to be stable against the other possible combinations you could make. And once you try to cram in four or five different components there, it gets a little crowded and they would rather separate and be something else instead. So we, um, we get pretty good at screening for that. And we, 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 we start usually one of these big discovery projects, we start with blanketing as, as broadly as we can, but then we see sort of hot spots. We see things where they pop up, and those can be expected places. That's good for benchmarking. They can also be unexpected, and we dig deeper. It's always possible we miss something, of course, because you've got to cast a fairly wide net to begin with, but that's how we start. So, I, yes, if you look at materials properties from the atoms up to the continuum level, you're looking at a lot of materials properties, but I'm, right, I'm just down here on the atomistic scale, and there we actually see that there is a limit to how many atoms you can cram into the same material. Thanks Thank for the question. And is there anyone over here who has not asked a question before in their group? Because this is going to be our last one for the night. And if not, you're going to have to negotiate. <laughs> ah, okay. And what is your name? Um, well, um, it, as I think that um, as there's so much data, um, I think that at a certain point, there won't be any need to get any new data because that would be already there. So um, if you would rather, who would you rather pick to be? Um, be actually an experimenter who does the experiments or an analyst who analyzes the data? I think in, in, in our case, we get the data ourselves and we analyze it ourselves. So there isn't a, a distinction. Uh, your premise, although, isn't really right. Uh, we can always use more data. And to use my example, the energy of the LHC is going to be raised, as somebody said in a previous question. So that will be new data, different data. We can also look for rarer phenomena, things that happen very infrequently, if we have a larger data set in which to look. So you can never have too much data. <laughs> Thanks. We're going to close the evening. Thank you, Berkeley Lab scientists. Thank you, audience. We'll be back here at the Berkeley Rep on December 2nd. And these t-shirts are available for sale in two weeks on the Friends at Berkeley Lab website. So please join. <laughs>